Hi folks, hope you're okay today. I just want to encourage you uh, today uh, concerning evangelism and sharing the seed of the Word of God, whether it be on YouTube or internet or wherever. So I'm going to read the parable of the sower and play a few clips. Uh, the parable of the sower. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such like crowds, large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore and then he told them many things in parables saying a farmer went out to sow his seed and as he was scattering the seed some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow but when the sun came up the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understand. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. What was sown in their hearts, this is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, <coughs> they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. This is John MacArthur on the parable of the sower. They knew what Isaiah wrote. They knew that the promise of Isaiah 9 was that the Messiah would come, come a son would be born, and he would be the wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and of the increase of his government there would be no end. In other words, he would come and establish a glorious, unending kingdom. Isaiah 9, they also could read in Isaiah 45 how the Messiah would not only be embraced by Israel, but he would be embraced by the nations of the world. That, that he would come to the Gentiles as well as to Israel. Messianic fever was running high in Israel. Uh, John the Baptist had drawn out to him at the Jordan River all Judea, if you will, to be baptized in preparation for the Messiah's arrival. That Messianic expectation was there, and we saw it reach its fruition or its high point uh, on the day that Jesus walked into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, and they were ready to hail him as the son of David and the Messiah. There was a tremendous amount of messianic expectation and hope, and John the Baptist had set that in motion, and Jesus had certainly escalated it because there was never anybody who denied his miracles. They didn't deny that he had power over disease, demons, and death. They saw that he had power over nature. They saw that he could create food. They were aware that he could read minds. They saw a kind of power in him that nobody could withstand when by himself he cleansed the temple of all of the riffraff, the religious establishment there who had set up their businesses to make money at the expense of the beleaguered people. It was pretty evident to everybody that Jesus was a miracle worker. 
that nobody could do what he did unless he had power from God. That seemed obvious. The religious leaders tried to change that mentality. They didn't want that, so they knew there was one other supernatural source in the universe, and that was Satan. And so they came up with the idea that he does what he does by the power of Satan. You've got to have some source for supernatural power. If it's not God, it's got to be Satan. They decided it would be Satan, and they made that their mantra, and they dogged the steps of Jesus and kept telling the crowd he does what he does by the power of Beelzebub. The people were caught somewhere between wanting to believe in Jesus and following the religious leaders, who basically were the architects of the religion they all adhered to. Phariseeism dominated Judaism, and it was the Pharisees and the scribes who came up with that mantra to explain Jesus' power. The crowds were huge. It was the greatest show in town. It was the greatest show that had ever been in town, in any town. Never in, in history had there been a miracle worker like this. Jesus essentially banished illness from Israel for the duration of his ministry. Demons screamed when he came into their presence and, and, and gave up their clandestine hiding place in the bodies of men and women and fled at his behest. They had never seen anything like this. They'd never heard anybody teach the way he taught. Messianic fever was high. And for those who believed... For those who were surrounding Jesus, he describes them in the end of chapter 3 as uh, my mother and brothers. Those are the ones sitting around me. Those are the ones who have a relationship with me. He moves from a human relationship, his mothers and brothers coming, his actual physical ones coming to find him. He says, these people have a real relationship with me because they do the will of God. And the will of God, according to John 640, is to believe in him. There was a little flock. He calls them a little flock. There were the few who came through the narrow gate and onto the narrow way. But it always seemed so difficult for them to get it. Why so few? When Jesus is so unmistakably divine, when his power is so unmistakably from God, when his teaching is so unmistakably superior to anything we've ever heard, when his life is so impeccably perfect, the crowd can be fascinated, the crowd can be attracted, the crowds grew and grew, and everywhere he went, some would drop off as he relocated, and more would come, and this shifting, ebbing crowd followed him relentlessly and everywhere, and numbered in the tens of thousands. The crowds were, however, superficial and exploitive, and they were a hindrance, though at the same time they were an opportunity. True believers were this little group of 12 apostles and other believers who when all was said and done after the resurrection only numbered 500 in Galilee and 120 in Jerusalem. And it raises the question, why so few? In Luke chapter 13, one of those disciples, I am sure on behalf of all the rest, who probably had conversations about this very often, came to Jesus and said, Lord, Verse 23, Luke 13, are there just a few being saved? Are there just a few being saved? Well, that's what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Few there be that find it. Many there be that go in the broad road. Are there just a few that are being saved? It was hard for them to understand because once they had come to believe in Jesus Christ and their faith had taken root and become the real thing and they had entered into the kingdom of God, Christ became all the more wonderful, all the more wondrous, all the more glorious, all the more lovely, all the more attractive. And when the thought was introduced, will you go away? They said, well, where are we going to go? You and you alone have the words of eternal life. That at the end of John 6, when some of the superficial followers left. So there was this little group of people who were his spiritual mother and brothers. They had a real relationship with him. And for them, it was very difficult to believe that the crowds could be so exposed to his teaching, so exposed to his miracle power, so exposed to his person, and never make a genuine commitment to him. Well, there were a lot of superficial commitments. There were a lot of part-time followers. Still are. It is in the context of that kind of issue that Jesus tells this parable. 
And it's a critical parable for us to understand if you want to get a handle on why people respond the way they do and where it comes from. And it is not primarily a parable about a sower because nothing is ever said about the sower. And it is not primarily a parable about the seed because there's only one statement made about the seed. It is a parable about soil. And there are six different kinds of soil, three bad and three good. Three in which nothing of any fruit is produced and three in which significant fruit is produced. And this is a picture of, uh, of the patterns of response to the gospel, both in that time and throughout this age. Rich, rich teaching. In fact, this teaching is so important that if you drop down to verse 13, I'll give you a little bit of a hint. Jesus said to them there, do you not understand this parable? And then he added, how will you understand all the parables? In other words, if you don't get this one, you won't get the rest. If you get this one, you'll get the rest. You get this parable in your mind and you will understand the other parables. For example, if you just go back to Matthew 13, where this parable is also recorded, you notice there that in Matthew 13, our Lord gives many parables. But the key that unlocks all of them, and the first one, is the parable of the soils. If you understand that, you will understand the parable of the wheat and tares, and you will understand the parable of the mustard seed, and you will understand the parable of uh, the dragnet. They all follow. This is the great paradigmatic parable. And since all of us have been given this great commission and everything works toward that great commission, it's essential for us to understand what we're dealing with and understand the responses that we're getting. Really critical. The setting is in the opening two verses. He began to teach again by the sea. This is the Sea of Galilee, as it was called, really a lake. It's a lake into which the Jordan flowing out of the mountains of Lebanon dumps at the north end of uh, Israel in the region called Galilee. It runs down through the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River, and the Jordan River then ends in the Dead Sea and has no outlet there. It is in that lake up in Galilee, the lake that dominates Galilee, that Jesus made his headquarters, most likely in the town of Capernaum, maybe even in Peter's house, which was located there. And he traversed the regions of Galilee all around that Sea of Galilee, and very often was teaching by the sea. Familiar place. We have seen him there in chapter 1, verse 16, 2, 13, 3, 7, here again. And it says there in verse 1, such a very large crowd gathered to him, they got into a boat in the sea and sat down. This was not unusual. If you go back to chapter 3 and verse 9, on an earlier occasion, it says there in verse 8, a great number of people heard what he was doing and came to him and he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd so that they would not crowd him. The only thing he could do as they pressed him toward the water was get in a boat and push the boat off into the water so he could create some distance between himself and the crushing crowd. The crowd could be so relentless and so dominating and such a hindrance that as it says back in chapter 3 verse 20, the crowd gathered again to such an extent they couldn't even eat a meal. I mean, they would have starved Jesus to death by never letting him escape to get to some food. They were so demanding. And they were there with all the people who were sick and all the people who were deformed and all the people who were obsessed and possessed laying their demands on him. Was it an opportunity? Sure, it was an opportunity, but it was equally a hindrance. And they're pressing so hard that he had to get in a boat and go off the shore into the water would have helped him be heard by the massive crowd with the hills in the background, a little bit of an amphitheater and his voice bouncing off the water so they could hear him. This is the usual scene by the lake. Crushing crowd of people wanting more miracles. They, uh, they endured the teaching to get to the miracles, really. And on this occasion, he was teaching them many things in parables. He was teaching them many things in parables. This is not new. Chapter 3, verse 23. He called them to himself, began speaking to them in parables. 
Now, let me help you with parables so you don't get too technical. Parable simply parabole in the Greek, para alongside parallel. It means to lay something alongside something else. Parabole means placing one thing alongside another for comparison. It's simply a way to make a comparison. I'm giving you a spiritual truth to help you understand that spiritual truth. I'll give you something that compares to it. It starts to get life. Uh, the ground is warm. There's moisture and water there, uh, and it starts to grow. The roots can't go down because they hit bedrock, and so whatever nutrients are there, whatever elements of life are there, shoot the plant upward, and that's why it says it immediately sprang up. It didn't go down. The roots didn't go down. They couldn't go down, so everything came up. But after the sun had risen, it was scorched because it had no root. It couldn't go down into the water table, down into the moisture, and it couldn't survive. And everybody would understand that. They had all sowed a field and then later looked at the field and seen one section of the field where the plants were up higher than all the other plants, and that would not be a good sign. That would be a sign that they couldn't go down and that soon they would die. Spring rains had ended. By the time the seed was in the ground, summer was really hot. Moisture was quickly drawn out of the superficial soil, and all the promise died. And Luke even adds, in his account of the parable, Luke 8, 6, it had no moisture. They would be very familiar with that. Third kind of soil, verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns, or the weeds. And the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. This is deceptive soil, no, no rock bed underneath, looks good, looks clean, looks ready, but down in the soil lie the fibrous roots ready to spring to life again. Hey, we've all weeded the garden, right? And the worst thing that can happen is you break the weed off at the top because you know it's coming back stronger than ever. You got to get the whole thing out. And everybody knows in a fallen world, weeds grow better than anything. Faster, taller, good seed and dormant weeds competing together, not good for the seed. The weeds squeeze out the life of the good seed. That was a very familiar situation. The thorn roots or the weed roots restrict the good seed, drink its moisture, veil its sunlight, and the good seed dies. Finally, there's three other kinds of soil in verse 8. Other seed fell into the good soil. These are all good. As they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. They all would know that not all dirt was the same. There would be some soil, uh, the nutrients in that soil would be superior to other soils. Uh, one would produce a certain relative uh, crop and the other uh, would produce a superior crop and the other would produce the most superior crop. Good soil is deep and soft and rich and clean. It's not competing. There's plenty of softness to go down to where the water rests. Seed gains, entry, finds nourishment, grows to an abundant harvest. And just to give you perspective on this, this would have been a shocking element. Jesus always threw a shocking element into virtually every story he told. And the shocking element in this story is a crop of 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, most of the things that I've read would suggest that, that an average crop would be 7.5%, not even 10%. 10%, 10th fold would be a, a massive, massive harvest. So the Lord really blows the lid off their thinking when he says, 3,000%, not tenfold, 6,000%, 10,000%. So we're talking about a kind of power in the plant that's way out of sync with what they would normally think. Now, again, some people look at the story and wonder, well, what does it mean? And if I don't explain it to you, if Jesus didn't explain it to us, you wouldn't have any idea what it meant. It would just be a story, and you'd say, okay, I know that. I've seen that. I understand seed falling on hard ground doesn't germinate 
it gets eaten by birds and crushed. I understand that seed falling on rocky soil doesn't, it germinates for a little while, but it can't get any water. When the sun comes out, it can't get down to where the moisture is, so it withers and dies. I understand that weeds and thorns choke out good plants. I understand that. I understand that seed falling into good soil is going to be productive, and relatively it will differ based upon the nutrients and the components in that given soil. I get it. But so what? What's the meaning of it? Well, before I tell you the meaning of it, let's go to the second point. The first was the parable. The second, the, the hearers. The hearers. So that's uh, John MacArthur. Uh, you can hear the full sermon on... Um, uh, So we're going to have uh, Peter Masters just for a few minutes, and then uh, I'll give my own thoughts on the uh, on it. Peter Masters on Good Trees Ministries. He's a minister at uh, Tabernacle, and he's a great guy. <laughs> at one of the most famous parables in the New Testament, the parable of the sower. And I've called our title for this brief address, Four Personality Types in the Bible. Now this has nothing to do with the four personality types that were taught in uh, Greek culture in ancient times which made rather an unlikely revival in recent years and which for all their superficiality and oversimplification had become very popular in some circles. One of the most extraordinary things that the Greek ideas about human personality should be revived in this most educated of ages. But we're looking at some personality types, if you like, here in this parable of the sower, for at least different attitudes towards the things of God and toward eternal things, which do reflect us and our deepest character and being. Well, this is the teaching of Jesus Christ, and we should look at it just to introduce the parable. In the first verse of this chapter, we read of how Christ went throughout every city and village in Judea, that is, preaching and showing the glad tidings, the good news of the kingdom of God. Good news it is indeed that there is free salvation with the Lord, that there is pardon, forgiveness for all sin, and new life with nothing to pay, because if there was anything to pay, none of us could have salvation and new life. It must be free, and it comes to us when we come before the Lord in repentance and faith trusting in Christ and what he has done in bearing away the penalty and the punishment of sin for all his people, all who would in due time come and repent and seek him and trust him. What good news this is. 
all we've ever done, all the sins we've committed, all our rebellion, everything which is foul and horrible and offensive to God, freely forgiven, and in its place new life, and a walk with God, with Christ, and eternal life hereafter. Well, with Christ, there were certain people, it's noted here, the twelve were with him, and certain women, quite a band of them, some of which had been healed from demon possession, so prevalent in that time, and some from other diseases also, and a great many other besides. But the record properly starts in verse 4. And when much people, this was one of the biggest crowds ever to come into the presence of Christ, when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, every town and village also, he spake by a parable, and this is it, this famous parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. A sower, well, before we get into it, just look, I'll tell you about verse 8 and the second part of it. As he closes the parable, the Lord says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And we shall see that in the parable, some people are described as being incapable of listening, incapable of hearing. That's a tragedy. I believe that was the case with me many, many years ago. Incapable of hearing and understanding. Well, we'll go on and look at how the Lord Jesus Christ describes it himself. But another verse before we get started, verse 18. Take heed therefore how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. That's about judgment at the end of time. That's about what happens to us when the light of this world turns out and the light of the next comes on and our soul takes its flight from the body, from time into eternity and we stand before God to be judged. And then, if we have faith in Christ and we have life and we possess these things, we have eternal life, and to walk with him, even more will be given to us. And we have these things only by his mercy and his free gift. But if we have nothing, no understanding of God, we wouldn't listen. And insofar as we did listen, we rejected it and turned away. So we have no forgiveness, no spiritual life. Even that which we may seem to have, if we have, say, a veneer of being religious, or worshipping will be stripped away from us and we will go away from the presence of God judged for our own sins for all eternity so that's the warning of Christ take heed therefore how you hear now the vast crowd and this is a parable for a vast crowd in other words every kind of person is here in this parable we are all here so we begin with verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed. What does that mean? What is the seed? Well, Christ a little later explains it. The seed is the word of God. It is the message of the gospel. Now, a seed, this is a very interesting illustration for the message of God. Because a seed is a given thing. It isn't manufactured. It doesn't come out of a factory. It's a given thing, right from ancient times to modern times. The seed was ready-made. And the way of salvation is like that. It, it wasn't invented by any human mind. It wasn't thought up by religious people. It was given by God, and so it must be. Only God knows on what terms he will save us, and forgive us, and take us to heaven, and what we have to do to seek him and find him. Only God can determine these things. No human being can invent a method of salvation, a method of becoming a child of God, or see into these things. So the seed 
very capably represents the message of God. It is spoken into the world, in the scriptures. It is given to us, and we listen to it. And you see, through this message, the gospel, if we understand it, tells us how to come to God, what God has done to make a way of forgiveness for us, how we are reconciled with him and walk with him. Well, dear friends, that's life. If we come and respond, we have life and we have eternal life. <laughs> what a brilliant thing the seed is to illustrate this. Because the seed gives life, the natural seed. It's sown in the ground and the plant grows and life ensues. So the illustration of Christ is so perfect and so apt. A sower went out to sow his seed the seed of the gospel. And as he sowed, and here are the, is the first of the different kinds of person. As he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. The wayside hearer. Christ explained this a little more in verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. What is this person? The person who is represented by the hardened pathway. Some of the seed falls on the pathway where people come and go and their feet tread it down and the earth there isn't soft and receptive. It's like iron. And the seed just rolls along the ground. And before it has any possibility of taking root, it's snatched by the birds of the air. Well, the ground represents us. And we have to ask, am I a wayside hearer? Am I described by this hardened pathway? What does this mean? Well, this is programmed people, brainwashed people. And I was like that. As a youngster, brainwashed by this present society, by the godless outlook, brainwashed and programmed. So as far as the message of God was concerned, I was unimpressionable. I didn't give it a moment's thought. If I ever heard it or read about it, was told about it, it didn't make any impression, no more than the seed bouncing along the hardened pathway. Well, now this is the challenge of this parable. Is that us? Are we incapable of taking in, understanding this message of God, which tells us how to find him and how to walk with him and know him, how to have our sins forgiven? Because we're like that hardened ground. It's this world that fully occupies us. We are dupes of material things. That's all we see. We live in a little box very small dimensions and horizons, just for the things which you can have and possess and enjoy in this world and feel and touch and see and describe here. We know nothing about God. We have no communion with him. We're superficial. Dear friends, I don't want to offend you, but I have to ask, when it comes to spiritual things, are you superficial? Untouchable? Means nothing to you. You're not capable of any deep thought about spiritual things, just sights and sounds. That's all for you. Appetites, influenced by this world. What's on next? What's happening next? What can I have next? What experience can I have? What can I do? Where am I going in life? What's going to happen to me? I live on the road, as it were, the thoroughfare, where all the traffic of this world and the ideas and the advertisements and the temptations go to and fro. That's uh, Dr. Peter Vastus, the parable of the sower, four personalities at Good Trees and Ministries. And now we're going to listen to Stuart Olliott on Know Your Bible. And... Uh, Here's what he has to say about the parable. We're sitting at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ and we're listening to his parables. And today we come to the parable of the sower in chapter 4 of Mark's Gospel and verses 1 to 20. There are five parts to this message. They're uneven in their length. The fourth part will be much longer than the others. 
The first thing we have to learn is that this is the most important parable of all, which is why in this series we come to it first. There are only two parables which are found in three Gospels. There are no parables found in four Gospels. But there are two parables found in three of the Gospels, and this is one of them. It's found in Matthew 13, it's found here in Mark 4, and it's found in Luke chapter 8. And in those three Gospels, it is also explained, which makes it unique. The parable of the wheat and tares is explained, but it's explained once in Matthew 13. The parable of the sower is explained three times so that we can never miss its meaning. And we notice in chapter 4 of Mark, verse 13, that Jesus made it clear that this parable is a key parable. Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So this morning, if we can't understand the parable of the sower, we won't understand any other parables. This is the one of which the meaning has been made abundantly clear to us. And of course, it's a parable about the word and the effect that it has. And therefore, if we can't understand this, we can't understand anything relating to the preaching of the word of God. If you want to understand how the invisible world works, if you want to understand the mechanism of spiritual things, then you must come to the parable of the sower. If you want to understand the Bible at all, you've got to come to this parable. That's our first point. This is the most important parable of all. Second point. It is about the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. In explaining the parable, he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now I spoke to you about ten months ago briefly about the kingdom of God when we were doing the Lord's Prayer. The kingdom of God, as you know, is a central theme in the word of God. Jesus, when he began his ministry, we read, after John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is a key subject in the scriptures. When Paul is locked up in his house prison in Rome, at the end of the Acts of the Apostles, we read that people came to him and he explained to them the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is not an abstract concept. We're talking about something real which affects every man and woman in this congregation this morning. The fact is that God is king in the lives of certain people. The fact is that certain people sitting in these very pews this morning do not live under the kingship of God. And others do. The fact is that there are certain people who live under the government of the God of Scripture. The kingdom of God is not a political kingdom with earthly boundaries, not a visible kingdom. The kingdom of God is in you, said Jesus. It is a question of the kingship of God. God reigns in certain human lives and in other human lives he does not reign. Some people wake in the morning and submit to him, and other people wake in the morning and don't submit to him. And this parable is about the kingdom of God, which is why it is absolutely essential to understand it. The prophets promised this kingdom, they spoke about it in very literal earthly terms, because they could only use the language that they had. But when Jesus came, he explained the spiritual nature of this kingdom, and particularly by means of parables. So this affects you, which is why also this is the most important parable of all. This is the most important parable of all, and it's about the kingdom of God. Now here's our third point. This kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, and therefore this parable is about spiritual work. The third point is this, all spiritual work, everything spiritual which goes on inside a man or a woman, all spiritual work 
is done by the word. Look at verse 3. Behold, a sower went out to sow. Verse 14. The sower sows the word. <clears throat> now when this was written in Greek, of course, it was at the time when the Greek language had no little letters. Everything was written in capital letters. When we come to translate it into English, how are we going to translate the word word? Are we going to put a capital W on it or a small w? Well, the answer is both. All spiritual work is done by the Word, with a capital W, meaning the Word of God. And all spiritual work is done by the Word, with a small w, meaning the spoken Word. All spiritual work is done by God's Word, spoken. That's what the parable is about. Now God has a word, it is the Bible. Jesus set his seal of approval upon the 39 books of the Old Testament as we have them. That known collection, he called the word of God. And Jesus sent his spirit to inspire the apostles and those that they supervised to write the New Testament, which also is called the word of the Father by Paul, the word of the Son by Paul, and the word of the Spirit by Paul. This divine library of 66 books is one word. It has been breathed out by God. It is true in all that it affirms. It is always right and never wrong. It is everlasting. And all spiritual work is done by the Bible. But a Bible, of course, can be shut and put on a shelf. Spiritual work is not done by shut Bibles. Spiritual work is done by the Bible preached. Preached in sermons, preached in Sunday school classes, preached in men's and women's meetings, preached on radio programs, preached in personal conversations. Preached. There are four words for preach in scripture and they are these. Heralding. Telling good news, bearing witness to facts, and explaining the concrete implications. But spiritual work is done by the Bible preached, spoken, the spoken word. Why am I emphasizing that? Because there's a great emphasis today upon the visual, not entirely wrong. It would be hard to read or hear the parable of the sower without visualizing it. There's a great emphasis today upon the acted. Big question mark in the Bible over any acting, because by definition an actor can't be sincere, because he's acting. A big emphasis today upon the sung. Not much emphasis upon the sung in the Bible. A lot of emphasis upon things sung in temple worship, but the New Testament church was decidedly unmusical. And if you want real music, you'll have to wait till we get to heaven. But a great lack of emphasis today upon the spoken word. It doesn't work anymore, people say. But spiritual work is done by the word and by the word. That's what Jesus is teaching. So this is the most important parable of all about the kingdom of God, telling us that all spiritual work is done by the word. And therefore, what is not done by the word is not spiritual work, is it? Here's the fourth point, which will be the longest. What you are spiritually is measured by the place that the word has in your life. You can take spiritual temperature. Some people have a zero rating. Other people are a little subnormal. Others are normal. But the, the thermometer 
which tells all is the place the word capital W small w has in your life the whole parable is about different responses to the word your spiritual state is decided or revealed would be a better word by your response to the word you can tell where you are spiritually by how you respond to the word of God now let's notice straight away the fact that you have some contact with the, the word of God tells me nothing about you and tells you nothing about yourself all these different classes of people which are mentioned in this parable all had some contact with the word they all heard it with their physical ears but that tells us nothing in and of itself about their spiritual condition it's your response to the word which reveals where you're up to spiritually your response to the word will reveal whether you're in the kingdom of God or not and your response to the word will reveal whether you're making spiritual progress or not so that said we're going to divide this fourth section into two here they are here's the first part of the fourth section we're learning here that it's your response to the word which reveals where you're up to spiritually part one some of you who hear the word are spiritually nowhere look at verse 4 it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it verse 15 these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown and when they hear Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts alongside the edge of an eastern field is the wayside a piece of flattened ground rather like a footpath some of you are like that says Jesus the seed falls on that flattened piece of ground the birds come and eat it it's like no seed had ever been there you hear the word of God preached but you pay no attention to it you come here because you come here you come to church because you come to church you come to church because the family make you come to church or you come to church because the family would raise his eyebrows if he didn't come to church but frankly you take no interest in the preaching your thoughts are elsewhere so the word of God is being read and preached but you're thinking about this or that or the other or nudging or whispering or passing a note or doodling but the word of God is having no effect you don't see the point of it you don't feel that the message concerns you whether the pastor is preaching the law or whether he's preaching the gospel you don't think it's going to do you any good and it doesn't it has no more effect on you than the seed sown which is gobbled up at once and so you go out of the door just the same you think as when you came in now there are lots of you like that says Jesus and there are lots of you like that Sunday after Sunday the devil snatches the way the seed because he's at work even if we're not and week after week it's just as if there was no sermon in your life there's no fear and there's no faith there's no feeling and there's no knowledge and there's no grace you don't care you take no interest it's just as if the Lord Jesus Christ had never lived as if it never died as if it never risen from the dead it's just as if it wasn't true or it never happened this parable is asking you how long you're going to go on like that are you going to live like that tomorrow are you going to die like that the day after are you going to meet God like that 
Are you going to go into eternity like that? Some who hear the word preached are spiritually nowhere. Now some of you are like the stony ground in a field. Look at verse 5. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no roots, it withered away. Verse 16. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Some of you, says the Lord of glory, you're like that. You hear the gospel preached, but it has no lasting effect. So here you are this morning, pleased to be in church. Okay, so that's three preachers, uh, John MacArthur, Peter Masters and Stuart Ollier, on the parable of the sower. The whole point of this video is just to get you to meditate on that parable and to think about it and ask God to speak to you uh, about the parable in your life and see what God has to say. All right, thank you for listening. It's been good to be with you and I'm going to close in prayer. I hope this uh, video will just encourage you. Uh, to meditate this week on this parable and ask God to speak to you and to use the parable in your life and in your ministry or if you don't know the Lord maybe it will speak to you about coming to know him let's come before the Lord Father we just thank you for this parable and we pray that we would apply it to our hearts and Father help us to scatter the seed of your word uh, throughout every means that we can and may you be glorified. Bless this video, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. And I hope this was a blessing to you. And God bless.